If you enjoy this video, please consider giving a thumbs up. It really helps the channel. And if you have any ideas for future videos, share them in the comments section below. This original bedtime story is made possible thanks to Slumberland patrons. If you would like to support this channel, you can find Patreon details in the description and on my channel homepage. So, as you just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And I don't know whether you'll relax deeper to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep story in the background. And this is a sleep story about a man who is out on a boat a little way off from the shore and he can see on his small boat the shoreline way off in the distance and he's on a small sailing boat. And as he rests on a towel on the front of that sailing boat, just enjoying some sun, with his eyes closed, feeling the warmth of that sun on his face, noticing the light through his eyelids from the sun, hearing the sloshing sound of the waves as they strike gently at the underside of the boat. And that subtle rocking motion of the boat on the water that makes the horizon just gently sway from side to side. And occasionally with his eyes closed just lying there, with his head facing up towards the sun. He can notice when clouds pass across the sun's face. As the dark shadow passes across his eyes and a coolness sets in on his cheeks before that cloud passes over and the warmth of the sun warms up his cheeks again. And as he rests there on this boat, enjoying the peace and quiet of relaxing, lying down, well away from the shore, no one else around, just peace and calmness, just the occasional sound of gulls in the air, the slight sound of the breeze in the background, the occasional sound from the movement of the boat, and that slight lapping sound at the underside of the boat. He finds himself drifting and floating into the most comfortable reverie. And as he begins to drift into the most comfortable reverie, he starts to have this sense of relaxing back against the trunk of a grand oak tree. And the oak tree is towering high overhead, and there's some mottled sunlight managing to work its way through the leaves and branches of the tree. And as he rests there against that tree, he can notice the dancing light against his closed eyes. And while he listens to the sound of the slightly moving branches and leaves overhead of the tree, 
He can also hear rustling from other trees, the distant sounds of children playing in a park, the sounds of birds, the occasional sound of distant dogs. And he finds resting here in this park so incredibly peaceful and relaxing. And while he rests there, he can breathe in that fresh air, cooled by the shade of the tree, and breathe out any stresses from the day, finding himself almost breathing in peace and comfort and calmness. And after a little while of just resting here under this tree, he gently opens his eyes, and his eyes have to adapt for a moment to the brightness of the day, although he's largely sat in shade. And as he turns his head to face forward, so the mottled light is no longer in his eyes. It's just coming down towards his head and his forehead. As he looks out from under this grand oak tree, over the most beautiful lush green grass, trees in the distance, seeing people walking, children playing off in the distance. And he takes a hand drum from beside him. He crosses his legs, sits up a little straighter, resting his back against the bark of that tree. And starts gently tapping on the notes of the drum, feeling the sensation of each strike with his thumb on the different notes. And he starts off playing each note once, the notes on the left hand side with his left thumb the notes on the right hand side with his right thumb. And then he taps the middle note with one thumb and then the other before beginning to instinctively play whatever rhythm comes to mind tapping with one thumb, then tapping with another, then tapping with one thumb, then tapping with another, gently beating out a relaxing rhythm, hearing the sound of that hand drum reverberating and playing around him, almost enveloping him in this most beautiful sound almost having a hypnotic experience as if he becomes one with the drum, one with the music, feeling a connection with nature while he just rests there playing. And he just plays his feelings, plays at the rate of his breathing, of his pulse, and gradually slows down his playing, to help guide his own breathing and pulse to be slowing down and relaxing. And he just sits there in a reverie, playing that drum for a little while, until he knows that it's time to move on. And he places that drum in a bag, puts that bag on his back 
and heads away from the tree, walks out into the park, feeling each footstep as he takes it across that grass, feeling the slight breeze on his cheeks while he walks through the park. And after a little while he finds his way to the exit of the park, leaves through that exit, walks down a footpath lined with hedges and trees. And he can watch as the butterflies and bees fly into the plants along the hedges. And birds fly down and grab berries from some of those bushes. And after walking for a little while along this footpath, undulating over gentle hills. He reaches a turning, walks down that turning, following a new path towards the most beautiful cottage with the most incredible garden. He heads towards the gentle gate of that cottage, carefully opens that small gate, walks through the gate and up to the cottage door. And he opens the door of his cottage, places his drum down in the living room, heads through the cottage, he grabs himself a glass of water, drinks that water while gazing out over the back garden, before heading out on this summer's day into the back garden. And in the back garden, he walks down one side, past an apple tree, and heads down to the rose bush at the end of the garden. He touches some of the petals of these roses at the end of the garden, feeling the waxy smoothness of those petals between his thumb and forefinger, touching so gently, so smoothly, With some of the other flowers, he runs his hand over them, touching them with the palm of his hand, touching them so gently, almost imperceptibly with his fingertips, exploring the sensation of the roses, admiring the growth of those roses, before sitting down on a bench that encircles a tree at the end of his garden, taking an old-fashioned typewriter out of a box where he has to pop it onto his lap, unclip the box from the left side and the right side at the base, and then lift the box up off of the typewriter to reveal that old-fashioned typewriter. And with that typewriter resting on his lap, he inserts a sheet of paper. He winds that paper through and then starts typing. 
the princess and the distant lights, he types. Once upon a time there was a princess, and she used to crave fun. She spent so much of her life having to be prim and proper. Now I say so much of her life, but her life has only been short, for she is only nine years old. But in those nine years, she's had to follow protocol. She's had to be punctual, attend appointments when she's supposed to attend appointments. She's supposed to stand in silence without moving a single muscle, without flinching, without looking away. Every part of her life has been regimented. And although she lives in the most beautiful of palaces, she doesn't really get to enjoy that beauty. Because from the minute she's awake, she has to follow routines. She has to do as she is instructed to do. And one day, this princess is walking around out the front of the palace, and as she walks around, she heads over near the bridge that goes from the palace over a deep trench to a road the other side of the palace. And that road leads down towards the nearby town. And while she's walking around the garden, and then heads over near that bridge, she sees the other side of the bridge. This elderly lady just stood there watching. And she's unsure who this elderly lady is, and she stops and watches back. And after a while, she decides that although she's not supposed to cross the bridge or leave the palace grounds without permission, she decides she's going to walk over and see who this woman is. She feels that it's an elderly woman. She looks friendly enough. And she walks over that bridge, looking behind her to the left and the right to see if she's being followed. And to see if anyone is noticing her. And she's aware that generally the guards who are supposed to keep an eye on her, are so used to her just pottering around in the garden between appointments, between the rigid parts of her day, that they get laps, they engage in conversation with each other, and they sometimes lose sight of her for a moment or two. And in those times she's found herself being able to sneak away, being able to hide from them, where although she can then hear them frantically searching, she can get a moment's peace before suddenly appearing again and saying that she had been in that area all along had they not seen her, had they not been paying attention. What will her father think if she has to tell him that the guards weren't paying attention. And so it doesn't happen often. But the guards then are unsure whether their lack of keeping an eye on her was because she chose to disappear off, or because they weren't paying appropriate attention. 
and she doesn't do it frequently enough to draw too much suspicion. And so now she's crossing the bridge towards this friendly-looking elderly lady. And when she reaches the other side of the bridge, the elderly lady begins to smile. And as she smiles, so she begins to look so much younger. And she crouches down to the height of the girl. And she says to the girl, I have a sense that you're not as happy as someone would imagine a princess would be. And she starts to share some truths with this princess. And the princess has this feeling almost like this elderly woman knows her somehow. And she says, I've got something that can help you. But to give you what I will give you to help you, you need to do something in return. She says, I need you to go and find me a book, a very, very specific book. And the princess says that she can't leave the palace. She won't be able to go and find this book. And the elderly woman says, that won't be a problem. And as she says that, she waves a hand. And then there's a puff of smoke heading back across the bridge. And that puff of smoke manifests into what looks like the girl, what looks like this princess running from the end of the bridge and playing around in the garden. And this woman says, when is your next appointment? And the princess says that they'll be wanting her to come back into the palace in about ten minutes' time. And the woman says that she'll have to find that book within ten minutes, or they'll discover that that girl running around the garden is just a projection of the real girl, and not actually the princess for she'll be relatively unresponsive because she's just a projection, almost like a hologram running around in the garden, that she looks real enough, but there's no substance, nothing to interact with. She won't stop playing out a part, almost like a video playing on a screen, that you can watch that video playing. But it is just a video, almost like a pre-recorded thing. So the girl, the princess, is aware that she's got probably about eight minutes to find this book. So she asks, where do I find the book? And why can't you get it yourself? And the elderly woman explains that she's elderly now. And she can't make it to where you have to go. And she's too big to go where you have to go. That she can do magic, but she can't shrink herself down. That's not the kind of magic that she can do. And she says that she can help the girl to make it where she has to go much quicker. She says that if you head beyond the town, all the way to the coast, there are cliffs along the coast edge. Up in the cliffs is a cave. 
deep inside a cave is that book. And then the woman twirls her hand and some white smoke begins spinning around and spreading out. And out of the white smoke, as it clears, is the most incredible unicorn. And the princess climbs onto the back of the unicorn. And this woman says, be back here in eight minutes, or they'll know that that girl running around the garden isn't you. And the princess is just excited to be on an adventure and riding a unicorn. And so she rides that unicorn. She heads all the way down towards the town. And then with a nudge in the side of the unicorn with her feet, the unicorn leaps off the ground and almost on a rainbow flies up over the town accelerates off towards the coast in what seems like no time at all. The unicorn arrives at the coast, lands on the cliff edge, and gently walks along the cliff edge. And the princess is aware that the unicorn is going to have to fly along in front of the cliff so that she can see where that cave is. So she turns the unicorn off the cliff. It leaps off the cliff and starts riding almost like on a cushion of air. And it heads along the front of the cliff. And the girl can see this small hole in the cliff. And the unicorn pulls alongside that small hole. And the princess carefully climbs over to the cliff and squeezes herself in that incredibly tight hole that seems like it would be barely big enough for a rabbit. She squeezes herself in through that hole into the cliff. She wonders how easy it will be to get back out again and once she's through the hole, she has to crawl on her belly. And she continues crawling and crawling on her belly, deeper and deeper in this cave. And she's aware there's no way the woman would have been able to fit in here. The only way someone could fit is if they were a child. And so she crawls further and further. She's aware that the time is passing by. And after some time, suddenly she reaches the end of this tunnel and it opens out into a larger chamber. And she drops down into this larger chamber with a bit of a thud. She can hear the wind echoing around the chamber, blowing in through that hole. She can hear the distant sound of the waves of the ocean reverberating into the chamber. And she walks around in this dark chamber with only the faintest light coming in through the hole that she has just crawled through. And then she gets startled and jumps a little. And realising what she was startled by and jumped a little by was her own reflection. And she notices that the walls of this chamber are mirrors. She runs her fingers over the glass of the mirrors. Feels the smoothness and the coolness 
of those mirrors. And then heads towards where the centre of the chamber would be. And in the centre of the chamber, she finds a plinth. And on that plinth, she can notice that there's a book. And she has to look slightly away from everything that she's trying to see so that her peripheral vision can see it better whenever she tries to look directly at anything. It's almost as if it vanishes. And she picks up that book and she's curious what it is that the elderly lady would want with this book. What is so important about this book? And once she's got that book, which feels heavy. And it's a substantial sized book that she has to hold in two hands. She heads back to that hole, following the faint light. She reaches up on tiptoes, places the book up through the hole, pushes the book a little way into the hole, before grabbing the edge and managing with all her might and struggling with her feet against the side of the cave to pull herself up into that hole. She then crawls back through it, pushing that book in front of her. Before reaching the entrance to the hole, seeing the unicorn still floating there in space, and trying to hold on to that book, she puts it under one arm, reaches over with the other arm, grabs around the unicorn's neck, and almost throws herself over onto the unicorn, drags herself up onto its back, and nudges the unicorn to head back to that elderly woman. And back at the elderly woman, she arrives on that unicorn, and she's very muddy from her experience and is worried that she'll get found out that she wasn't just playing outside and she can't go in looking this muddy for her next appointments. And she hands the elderly woman the book. And the elderly woman smiles on receiving the book, waves a hand and in a flash the girl running around the garden disappears and the princess's clothes appear clean again and the unicorn dissolves from the head down into smoke with that smoke then just dispersing across the ground. The woman opens the book and she explains that this book contains all the knowledge and wisdom of the universe. And she says that she can teach the girl this knowledge, this wisdom. That it's connected to the Akashic Records. It's connected to the library of the universe. And she starts reading through the pages. As she's reading through, so her form changes. And she starts to look a little younger. And a little more presented, like someone that would turn up to teach the girl. And her voice becomes younger. And she says to the girl, hurry along now, run back across that bridge. Head back into the palace, I'll be there in a minute. And the girl heads back into the palace. And she's told that for her next appointment, she's got to see a tutor and then she gets ushered through to a room. She sits down on a chair. And in comes 
her father with the tutor. He says the tutor has arrived, and he shows in this younger version of the elderly woman, who comes in smiling, introducing herself, saying that she'll be teaching the girl many skills, and that she'd already started her education. And the girl didn't really understand, and then the father left the room. And the woman explained that she had been called upon to teach this princess. But what she was going to teach would depend on the princess's response, would depend on the princess's attitude to life and the princess's abilities. And so she wanted to put the princess through a bit of a test. And now that princess, having passed the test, will be learning this knowledge that gets passed on from generation to generation. That each generation, the wizards and witches, find someone much younger who they can spend plenty of time educating with all the knowledge that they possess. And then that person can help bring good to the land, applying that knowledge. but they have to test that person to make sure that the right people are given the knowledge and that those people are capable of engaging with the training and learning. And the princess has passed the tests and that as part of this, the princess is told, she will gain more freedom more independence, because they can set her tasks that allow her to have freedom while seemingly doing something regimented. And the princess doesn't fully understand, but she likes this new addition to her life and the experience she's had in the last few hours. And that man carries on typing, that sound of the typewriter with each press of a letter, the movement of the typewriter, the dinging as it reaches an end and springs back. And after writing for a while, he stands up from under that tree, puts that typewriter down, gathers up the papers that he's typed out today, packs the typewriter away near the tree, walks across his garden into his home, he relaxes for the evening before heading to bed and drifting and floating so peacefully, so comfortably asleep. And the man on the boat drifts out of his reverie as he notices that the warmth on his face isn't so warm now, but it doesn't feel like it's just clouds passing by. And as he opens his eyes, he begins to see what he came here for. He begins to see his reason for coming all this way on the boat out from the shore, he gazes up at the most beautiful blanket of stars, and highlighted in the corner of his vision is a comet that he can almost have a sense of hearing, just hovering in space. 
stretching across the night sky. And the more he looks just slightly away from it, allowing his eyes to habituate to the light, the more detail he notices in that comet's tails. And he takes the opportunity to get some photographs of the comet. He can see the distant lights on the shore. He has this sense that the sloshing sound of the water seems to have changed as night fell. And after spending hours watching that comet, watching some meteors, just enjoying the twinkling of the stars, He heads inside his sailboat, heads to a bed inside the sailboat, relaxes down into that bed, and drifts and floats so peacefully asleep, and while he's drifting and floating peacefully asleep, a part of him is curious about his reverie he was having earlier. And so he begins to recall that reverie of that man, of that writer, with his cottage, writing his story about that princess. He's curious not only about the reverie of the man and his cottage, but also of the details of the story that the man was writing. And so he gives that some thought. He allows his attention to be drawn to the details in the cottage so that he can begin as he drifts and floats so peacefully, so comfortably asleep to associate himself back into that experience, back into that man in the cottage so that he can continue while he sleeps to dream of that man in the cottage and to see where the story that he's writing goes with the hope that he can be aware in the dream enough to encourage the dream to change so that he can head back out, sit back down and carry on typing that story And while he drifts and floats into the experience, he falls so peacefully, so comfortably, asleep for the night, almost rocking gently asleep on that boat, on that calm, lapping water, drifting and floating so peacefully asleep.